Lincoln High School in San Francisco wants to rename itself because Abraham Lincoln was apparently not woke enough. And Michigan, Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer, she brings in Santa as reinforcement to convince children to obey her lockdown rules. And then the Washington Post wrote an entire op-ed in defense of Pete Buttigieg's statement that airports can be romantic. <laughs> We've got all that much more coming up, and it starts right now. Happy Thursday. Welcome to the news and why it matters. I'm Hillary Kennedy. I'm filling in for Sarah Gonzalez while she is out on maternity leave. So I believe Hanukkah ends tomorrow. Christmas starts next week. There's a whole lot going on. So I hope it's been putting you in a festive mood. You've been focusing on the good things. And one of the good things I'm focused on today, I've got two amazing guests here to talk around the table. So first, we're going to start with Yaku Buyans, the president and founder of Share Together and host of the Yaku Buyans show. Thanks for good being to be here again. Hillary. Always happy when you're here. Thank and you. then Tommy Vext, you're joining us all the way from California. You're the lead vocalist of the multi-platinum recording artist Bad Wolves. Yes, ma'am. And the co-host of Deviant Gentleman podcast. We are so happy to have you here. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited. It's good company. Yeah. All right. So we've got a lot of fun stuff to talk about today. Um, this one, I would say this is a fun topic, but uh, this one's really interesting because we've seen a lot of chatter about Abraham Lincoln and some of our historical figures being renamed, statues taken down, that kind of thing. Well, Abraham Lincoln's name, along with the names of dozens of other historical figures in connection to slavery, genocide, or oppression, his name soon may be coming off buildings in the San Francisco School District. So, Friday's the deadline to have all the names submitted for consideration. The San Francisco Chronicle shared some insights from the man who's in charge of the renaming committee as to why Lincoln and some of these figures are on the chopping block. He said, uprooting the problematic names and symbols that currently clutter buildings, streets throughout the city, it's a worthy endeavor. He said, only good can come from the public being reflective and intentional about the power of our words, names, and rhetoric within our public institutions. So the committee spreadsheet has notes on the research. It listed the federal treatment of Native Americans during Lincoln's administration as the reason. It said the discussion for Lincoln centered around his treatment of First Nation peoples because that was offered first. Once he met the criteria in that way, we did not belabor the point. Now, Lincoln historians say was focused on the Civil War and therefore did little to change policies related to Native Americans, but he had planned to. He just didn't live long enough to have the chance to do it. But for the renaming committee, they're saying Lincoln's treatment of Native Americans, it was more bad than good. That's why he made the renaming list. So. Yaku, I'll start with you. Does this seem fair at all to you? Not at all. Not at all. He, okay, I want to ask you a simple question. Throughout BLM, Chop Chaz, all the things we've been through, have you heard the left ever talk about the Native Americans? No. They've never cared about the Native American, the unaffiliated tribes in this nation. When it's good for them for their cause, they'll pull this out of the bag because how do we go after Abe, honest Abe, by the way, who helped, who helped stand against slavery, only way we can go after him, yeah, that tribe, the Native Americans, let's pull them in here. Yeah. If you really cared about the Native Americans, it would have been all lives matter. It would have been the most you know, a, a attacked tribe in our history here, the Native American. Nobody cared about them. So this is, this is, this is a, a reach. I think you said that offline. Mm -hmm. um, and, but it will show you they'll eat their young. I've told you before in South Africa, removing a statue or a name from a street does nothing. It heals nothing. It accomplishes zero. It actually breeds hate and resentment on the other side. Hate breeds hate. Hurt people hurt people, mm -hmm. right? So no, it's just, I, it's just laughable to me that all of a sudden now they want to talk about the Native American. You've never heard them talk about Native Americans. We should. We should. The forgotten people of our nation. Right. 100%, right? I mean, I, I was on a, on a reservation for 18 months, you know, in, in, in North Dakota. The forgotten people, this, it's, it's so hypocritical. When it suits their narrative, they'll, they'll pull it out of the bag. I mean, what do you think? Well, this is a, I mean, for me, uh, I'm mixed race. I'm half African-American, I'm half Caucasian. Uh, if it wasn't for Abraham Lincoln's efforts to free slaves and allow us to be, you know, do the, do the thing that was right for the African-American community that was living and working and contributing to building the foundation of America, I wouldn't even be able to be alive. Mm -hmm. And so um, 
I think that this is just another, uh, it's another desperate grab at trying to change things and institutions um, because there seems to be, a, there's an assault on patriotism. And I think the left tried to make patriotism synonymous with racism or any form of negativity. And this kind of excuse of the, the Native Americans, Abraham Lincoln was murdered. He was murdered because he, he freed the slaves. Yeah. And, and that cost people money, you know? And, a lot, and you know, one of the funny things that I always, I remind people when I, when I get into these, these kind of topics of conversation is that people don't realize that in the Civil War, the, the Democrats were the South. They wanted to continue to institute slavery. slavery. Yeah, and so yeah. there's this kind of ideology that, oh, the, the party switched at some point. Um, well, it feels like it switched back. Yeah. You know? Well, and it's interesting, too, because I feel like in situations like this, isn't it kind of teaching society, everybody has to be perfect, and if they aren't, then they have to be canceled. And the criteria they're using for him, it kind of erases all the good that he did do, because they're only focusing on, on the bad and the negative. You're talking about a man who lost his life to fight for a group of people that's not his group of people, mm -hmm. right? Lost his life. But that, remember now, this is the same group of people that during the, the riots, when we said, can we, can we remember what Martin Luther King did? How he created progress? Wasn't with war. They don't want to have that conversation, mm -hmm. right? And so it, I just think it's, a, it's an abandonment of truth. It's an anti-God movement. And it's anything that at one point stood for something that you could nitpick at and say, I'm not there today. They'll pivot on it, right? And so it's dangerous because it sets a precedent, which means nothing can stand. Right. A friend today is an enemy tomorrow. Watch your back. You know, this is like girl on girl crime in high school. Mm -hmm. You never know who, I mean, who's out who's to get you. Friend, yeah. And they just flip flop. And how do you run a society like that? You can't. Well, you brought up uh, Black Lives Matter. So now some Black Lives Matter chapters, they're revolting against the organized movement's national arm, accusing the leaders of providing very little financial transparency and also not much in the way of financial support. Ten local chapters issued a statement outlining their concerns regarding financial disclosure, decision making, accountability since the establishment of the Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation. So in June, the Daily Caller reported that the BLM Global Network, they spent millions between July 2017 and June 2019 on consultants and staff compensation. Specifically, it spent $900,000 on travel, 1.6 million on consulting, and 2.1 million on staff during those years. It doesn't show, these figures don't show other types of financial support given to the local BLM chapters. The BLM Global Network, they announced in June, it's launching a $6.5 million fund to support the grassroots organizing work for its local chapters. And beginning July 1st, those chapters were allowed to apply for up to $500,000 in grants. But the local BLM chapters, they're saying, hey, those funds being offered are the result of their grassroots efforts. The local chapters urged supporters to donate directly to those chapters. And they said, you know, hey, there's a lack of transparency and placement of the decision makers. So tell me, you've done a viral video explaining how BLM demonstrations are being infiltrated by outside agents. Mm -hmm. Would you explain some of that to us? Yeah, uh, well back in April I did a, a diagram with markers that went, I think it got 37 million views in four days and then it caused a lot of problems. Uh, you know, I got a lot of phone calls about it and then it wound up getting taken down off the internet. Uh, but you know, basically, you know, BLM as a movement, obviously, Black Lives Matter. Obviously they do. Of course. I don't think anyone anywhere would disagree with that. Mm -hmm. um, what I saw happening was I saw people uh, protesting and being and the protest being infiltrated by uh, Antifa or hired goons who who almost like the brown shirts like a lot of people might not know the history of the Nazi party or the Night of the Broken Glass when there were protests and agents were placed into the protest to destroy all the Jewish owned businesses. Uh, and this is what we saw a, a repeat of history. And, you know, the news makes money off of it. Uh, the mainstream media films it. They say it's, they, you know, they call them peaceful protests, but there's buildings on fire and people destroying and looting. Um, mm -hmm. And then you know, essentially what happens is, is that the money that gets raised from that goes to Act Blue. 
and yeah. a little bit of research and looking into their websites and finding where the money goes. That's why I always say, chase the money, find always. where the money goes. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, of, the, of all the Democratic names on the Act Blue list, who are the beneficiaries of the donations to BLM, I, didn't, I couldn't find one African-American person. <laughs> so That's incredible. Yeah, so it's, 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 I'm not surprised that this is happening now. Mm -hmm. um, and my hope is that these leaders of the community will come to a place where they realize they've been had. And, and I think it's, and this might be the time where we all come together and say, what's been going on is not okay and we need to remedy this situation because nobody likes to feel used. Yeah. Of course, you know? yeah, and, I, and I, that's such a good point. And I, and I hope and pray that does happen because people are being used. Like we've said for so long, Margaret Sanger, Planned Parenthood, targeting the African-American community being used. And I just want people just for the scales to come off eyes and see it for what it is, because this is exactly how you run socialism, right? You've got the masses working for the 1%, so the 1% up top r raise big money. The move, the, the move, not the heart behind it, but the organizational structure raised a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Now you've got people down the line saying, well, wait a second, you, you're only there because of the grassroots movement, of course. And they're crying out saying, well, where's our piece? So what they're really actually saying is, hey, this should be run in a capitalist manner. Mm -hmm. We worked, we contributed, we earned some of the respect, the favor, the recognition, whatever, can you support us? So really, I hope people slow down for a second and go, okay, maybe I'm aligning a little more with capitalism here. Maybe I'm aligning a little more with, hey, if I've contributed, a worker's due his wages. Not that I just say it's about pay, but what I'm hearing these organizations are saying, downstream, we're in this with heart. Mm -hmm. yeah, and and I, we're fighting. And I think to, to <laughs> add to that, even the people who volunteer their time for this, those people would like to see the money go into the community. The community. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're not seeing. Uh, and it's, you know, the, this money should be going for schools. It should be going for uh, after care so that parents can work Single while their mothers, kids, whatever, yeah, yeah. So, that, so that the parents can still be at work while the kids have after school programs. And p kids need structure, you know? And that, to me, to just abandon all that, after so much was done and there was so much pain and so much hurt and we you know we saw the the tapes we saw the tragedy we all hurt and then for all everything that was uh kind of all the negativity that was the result of that nothing for nothing positive to come out well and i think the average person who donated at least the people i know that did that's where they thought their money was going. And they thought yes, it was absolutely. going straight into the community. They thought it was going to help uh, support some of the black owned businesses that had, you know, had difficulty this year or the schools. And so it is disappointing for anyone to think that money that they're giving with a charitable heart to any organization, you find out, wait, it's not being used at all for what I thought it was being used for. Yeah. That's very disappointing. Yeah. All right, so we have to go to break here in a minute. Uh, when we come back though, we're gonna talk a little bit about Dr. Fauci being a Grinch this Christmas. All right, first we wanna thank our sponsor, Home Title Lock. So here's how easy home title theft is. The legal titles to our homes, they're digitized and kept on government and business servers and in the cloud where they can be hacked. A cyber thief finds your home's title, forges your signature on a quick claim deed stating that you sold your home to him and then is done. He takes out loans against your home until all your equity's gone and then leaves you in debt and you won't even know about it until the collection calls come pouring in. You aren't protected by insurance, your bank, or those common identity theft programs, but Home Title Lock does protect you. Home Title Lock, in the unlikely event you become a victim of title theft while a member, they will spend up to a quarter million dollars in legal fees to help restore your home's title. So go to HomeTitleLock.com, register your address to see if you're already a victim, and then use code RADIO for 30 free days of protection. That's code RADIO at HomeTitleLock.com. We'll be back in just a minute. Christmas time, it's a time of celebration, joy, time to be spent with your friends and family. Unless you're Dr. Fauci, who says we all need to just cancel Christmas and it's something we just need to accept. He says that he and his wife will not be spending Christmas with family this year and advised 
other American families to follow his example. He said, I'm gonna be with my wife, period. He said, my daughters are not going to come home. That's painful, we don't like that, but that's just one of the things you're going to have to accept as we go through this unprecedented, challenging time. He does advise Americans to stay home as much as you can, keep your interactions to the extent possible to members of the same household. He said, this cannot be business as usual this Christmas because we're already in a very difficult situation. We're gonna make it worse if we don't do something about it. He, he maintained the independent spirit in the United States of people not wanting to comply with public health measures has certainly hurt us. What do you think about him saying you should only spend Christmas with those in your household, nobody else? I'm, I'm struggling with where is the mind of a man that thinks he can cancel the birthday celebration of Jesus? <laughs> I mean, I mean you've got to be absolutely certifiably insane to think that you have the power to self-elevate to God's status, that you can cancel Christmas? The answer is no, <laughs> Dr. Fauci. We actually believe in our faith. And not, nothing you say or anybody else is going to make us not celebrate, right? And may, can we just be reminded, it's a doctor who hasn't seen a patient in a very long time, but he's a doctor, right? 99.96% survival rate, okay? And now we want to cancel Christmas, cancel Thanksgiving, shut down the world, rip families apart, right? You know Christmas season is the highest suicide season already. It's the highest depression season already. People struggle through, through vacation mm -hmm. and holidays. And now you want to pull them from loved ones that could, you could bring love, could reconnect them. It is, it's reckless. This is the collateral damage that no one's measuring in this country at the moment, that people don't want to talk about. The left doesn't want to talk about it. So I say that's absolutely reckless, and I disobey that order. 100%. Right. Well, and what you touched on, it's something I would love to get your take on too, Tommy. Like, what do we do in this situation when there are a lot of people that have been shut in all year, and there are incredibly high rates of depression and suicide? I mean, what do you think we'll do to those people? Uh, well, I think, I think there, there's a lot of there are a lot of people who are suffering from this there's you know if you if you break it down this year alone if you look at the suicide statistics and then death from overdose you know we're having a major opioid crisis in this country and by continuing to isolate people and keep them from their routines keep them from their recovery keep you know keep them from their families uh it's not it's not good and i don't really know on what authority I, I actually don't know why we still listen to this man yes. not to discredit him as a doctor but if you you know we have youtube you can literally watch everything that he has said all year and it's it's constantly jumping around mm -hmm. you know he his solutions are almost like from the from office space like it's a jump to conclusions, Matt. And he just, you know, the, the camera goes on. He's like, it's this. Don't wear masks. We need the masks. The, only the doctors need masks. No, everybody needs to wear a mask. No, we don't need masks. Well, the problem with the mask, you know, so that everything flip-flops. Right. Or he truly is a mouthpiece for the powers that's really at hand. And that's the only solution I can come to. How many times he's flip-flopped. This is the very same doctor that says masks don't work. Right then masks work. And so the only conclusion I can come to is somebody is instructing him and he is the front man. Yeah. And that's why it's like, okay, yes, I'll say that now. Well, the nation has to look at this like, if uh, imagine if you had cancer, God forbid, and this was your doctor, and you go and do tests and like, you don't have cancer, you're fine. And they're like, you have cancer. And they're like, well, what do I do? Like, well, we're gonna do this, but it's not gonna work. But it's just to make everybody feel better about the fact that you have cancer. cancer yeah. And then you come back, you're like, well, you don't actually have this kind of cancer, yeah. but it might be this thing, but we don't really know. And the data isn't in. And so if that was your doctor, you'd get another doctor. Immediately. And I don't know why we're stuck with this guy <laughs> yeah, who's so inconsistent. Him. And I know that science is not, is, you know, it, it changes. And, but it's, it's a, you know, it's too much for us to, to dictate our freedom, yeah. mm -hmm. our freedom of movement, our freedom of religion, our freedom of speech, based off the words of one man. Right. Like we, I want a panel of doctors. Exactly. Well, you know who else is sending Christmas wishes out? Governor Gretchen Whitmer. She's using Santa Claus to tell children to comply. We have video of that, let's take a listen. Thank you for joining us. I'm 
Governor Gretchen Whitmer, and I'm really excited to be here with all of you. And I also know someone who's been really following the rules and making sure that he stays safe and the elves stay safe. And so my special guest is Santa Claus. Hello, boys and girls, how are you? Does anyone have a question for Santa Claus? Santa, do you have to wear a mask? When I'm in my workshop with all my elves, we all are masked up in social distancing. Hi, how can we keep people safe for Christmas? What I would suggest to do is what the governor is telling all the people of the great state of Michigan to do. Social distance, wash your hands, <laughs> and make sure you wear your masks when you're outside your home. And another way to stay safe during the holiday is to stay home, but call your grandparents and your cousins and your family, and it's the safest way to tell the people you love how much you care about them. This year, it has to look a little bit different so we can stay safe. So she stopped short of saying, and no fun for anyone. Don't have yeah. any fun. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's so like the, may I? Sorry. Tom. Yeah, I no, I'm, I mean, just, I mean, I'm just I mean, cracking yeah, up you at keep, this, you keep, the prospect Why don't you this. write a song about it <laughs> as you sit there? <laughs> well, okay, can, can, can I just say something? Okay, it's so like the left to use a lie to reinforce a lie. If, I don't know if children watch this show. Santa is a lie. So you're going to use a lie to, that's so the work of Satan, okay? I'm going to use a lie to reinforce a lie. It's a lie that this virus is going to kill everybody because if it did, people would be falling over and laying in the street, okay? But they use a lie. That's for me, that's major foul play. That is indoctrinating a young mind with a, one adult's ideology and planting seeds in very impressionable minds through a figure, figment figure, no elves, no Santa. Be, my kids know there's no Santa, okay, because I'm going to lie to my kids. And you may do what you want to do, but I don't want this kind of nonsense because if my kid's teacher brings Santa, they're going to go, I'm going to listen to this guy. This guy's in a suit and this is fake, right? But it's so the left to do something like this. And for me, that's major foul play, major foul play. Tell me, what do you think? Oh, no. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I, so I, I kind of look at this it's so ironic because i there are certain people in my life who are extremely left-leaning and i treat them like children who still believe in santa claus and so <laughs> just watching That's this well. it's <laughs> hilarious and it's like they're you know they're it's, it's like you said it's it, there's there's is a sense of comedy in the uh, the extreme measures that yeah. these people will go to indoctrinate or force their ideologies like we already know that uh you know if if the if you have a 99.97 percent of surviving covid as an adult children are almost completely yeah. unaffected by this mm -hmm. so you you know you've got a better chance of me going to the north pole you know than those <laughs> kids getting covid and dying so it's just it's just more, uh, it, it's just more comedy, mm -hmm. you know? And so I think that it's, uh, going back to the mental health thing, having a good sense of humor about the, the indoctrination tactics mm -hmm. and because otherwise you get, like, yeah. if you get mad about everything or uh, the outrage, it ties mm -hmm. you up in knots. And that's what I see happening to mm -hmm. My my friends and family, loved ones and people I know who are subscribing to this, mm -hmm. these lies. They're tight. They're not happy. They're very upset. They're afraid. Yeah. And the more that fear is spread, the the less free we are. And so, yeah. And, and you just said it. Remember, on, in the sex trafficking fight, they go younger, younger, younger. They want to sexualize children at age five now. Well, look at what they're doing. They want to instill fear as young as possible. Mm -hmm. right? And when the child is afraid, so goes the child, so goes the parent. You know, that, that child is afraid. I mean, you're gonna lock, you just said it, you're gonna lock a family up. Yeah. L literally, like, people so tightly we are walking in fear. I mean, that's fear doctrine. I agree. It's, Christmas has not been canceled. No. Not, not here, not anywhere. <laughs> All right, so we gotta go to break. When we come back, we're gonna be talking about the uh, coronavirus relief package and where we're at with that. Stick around. The Santa Claus me. Oh, my goodness. <laughs>
So week after week, one of the top Google searches is about the next round of stimulus checks or when is this coronavirus relief package going to come out. So they are still negotiating. Uh, congressional leaders, they continue to hammer out the details of a $900 billion coronavirus relief bill alongside a year-end spending bill as another government shutdown looms this Friday. So Senate Majority Whip John Thune said the proposal would likely include direct checks to individuals of $600 to $700, um, expanded jobless aid of $300 a week through March. Both of those are about half the size of the payments included in the CARES Act from earlier in the year. Uh, Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer, he said lawmakers are very close to reaching an agreement. He did maintain Democrats are going to push for another aid package at the beginning of 2021 when they expect Joe Biden to be sworn into office. They're trying to attach the $900 billion deal to a $1.4 trillion omnibus spending deal, and it has to pass by tomorrow in order to prevent a government shutdown at midnight. Yaku, do you think it's actually going to happen this time? No, shut down. Okay. The money's not going to get to the people. Just like Black Lives Matter didn't put the money in the community. You know, we sent about 400 uh, billion back from the first stimulus. I think it was about that number that wasn't dispersed to the people. We're seeing restaurant owners saying, I never received a check. You're not helping me. We're going to see the state of California be bailed out by this. The state. They're going to bail out these institutions, corporations. And what this amazing man said earlier is, I want to see families. If you're going to print money as if this is the monopoly universe, which our children's children are going to have to pay for because no money is free. Nothing's free mm. in life. This isn't China where we just print money. Mm -hmm. China can actually back their yen with gold. We don't even have anything to back it with, right? We're just printing it. Right? If you're going to do that, you better put food in the mouths and shoes on the feet and clothes and books, textbooks in front of children. Or I say, absolutely mm -hmm. no. Don't bail out any state or any corporation. Yeah. No, I think you're right. What do you think, Tommy? You think that this is, they're actually going to do something to help small businesses this time around? I mean, yeah. I would, well, history would, would have me lean on the pessimistic side. Some part of me still hopes that people will still do the right thing and, and the country has taken such a hit. And it is, it's, it's, it's a, the small business owners, the working class, the families, yeah. um, you know, we're seeing, I mean, I, I'm from New York City. I've lived in LA for 15 years and um, just watching restaurants and businesses close, obviously like the entire live performance market is shut. So there are, there are people who I've worked with for 20 years who can't pay their bills or feed their kids mm -hmm. because they spent their entire life um, becoming professionals at a at a job that no one can have right now. Mm -hmm. So, I'm I'm optimistic because, like Abraham Lincoln said, uh, the better angels of our natures. Uh, I'm I'm gonna I'm losing the the quote, but I I just I need to still believe that there that some politicians will do the right thing. Right. I I, I believe. But if I look at history, and I want that, I yeah. want it. I want, I want the money to get to the people who need it most. Right. Yeah. But, but history just tells me there's things in the bill that we don't know about, which tells me a Senate majority, which is conservative at the moment, which is fighting for their lives, mm -hmm. are not going to give up an easy loss. Yeah. So that's why I think you have a stalemate tomorrow night. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's because the Senate's fighting to stay conservative, and now I'm, I'm telling you, there's Green New Deal crap all over that thing, mm -hmm. okay? And that's why I think there's a stalemate. But I want to see it go through, right. if it's going to go to the people. Right. Yeah, yeah we want to yeah. make sure it gets in the right hands. So I'm interested to, since you live in California, I'm interested to know what you think about this story. So there is a, a major push to recall California Governor Gavin Newsom. And this thing is actually gaining a lot of momentum. Rescue California is the group. Uh, they have two to 3,000 active volunteers on the ground in California working towards this. They have a really strong group of volunteers, actually. They already have 820,000 signatures in its effort to prompt a recall vote, which allows voters to directly remove an elected official from office before his or her term is up. Now, they need 1.5 million signatures by mid-March to put the issue on the ballot, but they 
they're getting awfully close. What the senior advisor there said, what makes this different is it's Gavin Newsom itself. He's his own worst enemy, and every day he does something more that puts him deeper and deeper into controversy, and he's become a problem here in California. He shut down the fifth largest economy in the world in the last nine months, and every single person out there in California should be outraged by that. So I ask you, are yes. you outraged by that? I am out. That's what I am. Uh, <laughs> yes. I've moved from, you know, I spent 14, almost 15 years in Los Angeles, um, and this year I moved to uh, Huntington Beach, which is more conservative. Uh, you know, you see over the past several weeks, Newsom putting further lockdown orders, curfews, uh, the Orange County police, Fresno, all these different sheriff de sheriff's departments publicly stating that they will not follow through with these mandates because they're unconstitutional. Um, I, I did attend a curfew, I've attended two curfew breaks and um, you know, I, I know Major Williams. I, I go to these things with like Tito Ortiz, and there's there are several people in in sports and entertainment that we kind of meet up together and we support this. And there's thousands of people at this, and uh, and I think Californians are fed up, and I think it's on both sides. Like we see a lot yeah. of people who traditionally, even like myself, who traditionally as uh, you know, when I was younger, identified as Democrat, uh, switching parties, and I think the you know the vibe is different you know you go down to a curfew protest and i mean there's something amazing happened the last at the last one uh you know you have latinos for trump you have you know MAGA hulk and all these other people and trans for trump showed up i've never heard of them they were there and everyone embraces them mm -hmm. you know and so yeah. there's so much diversity at these kind of patriot rallies uh, and it doesn't get a, a lot of coverage because mm -hmm. it destroys this idea that to love America, you have to be, you, you know, it's like you hate and anyone that's different. And it's not the case. Right. And I think Californians who are moving in a conservative direction are at the forefront of literally embodying all the things the left pretends to be, mm -hmm. you know? And so uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm loving seeing what's going on and, and people are, doing there you know it's a it's amazing it's well, a movement do you think there are people in california that actually think newsom is doing a good job no, <laughs> no. okay nobody i don't think anyone thinks he's doing a good job i think that there are people who are um committed to orange man bad syndrome is what i call it yeah. and so they're prejudiced against the uh, against what they've been told the standing president is allows them to make excuses for uh, the opposite party's complete mis miscarriage of constitutional mm -hmm. law. So we only I, have one minute, so tell me your You know, when the me. hand that feeds you starts to bite you, people pay attention. Mm -hmm. And they've supported him. There's many reasons to remove him. This is the number one guy in the United States that wants to sexualize children. He's radical with his sex ed stuff. He's radical with his lockdowns. I believe he wants to be a celebrity. I believe, personally, I've got no proof, mm -hmm. but I believe he wants to run in 2024 for president. I think he's building a huge internal team and network within the Democrat Party. But Californians I'm speaking to that are very liberal, right, are not able to pay rent. Mm -hmm. yeah. And now all of a sudden, the very person they elected is saying, I'm shutting you down again and you should t take it. Right. Because I'm Gavin Newsom and they go, Absolutely not. And you see sort of a rainbow nation thing happening in California. We saw in South Africa. Mm -hmm. People are coming together that wouldn't even ever be together. And mm -hmm. they're going, wait, you, you tell us to love and hate. No, no, we're just going to really love. We love our country. We love people. And we love our differences. Mm -hmm. We should respect our differences, you know, cultures and whatever. Anyway, so. I, I agree. It'll be really interesting to see what happens, but they don't need all that many signatures left to make it to no, March. They're, so. they're getting close. Yeah. And the judge ruled that he, they gave him an extension. Really? Yeah, so they approved the extension to two more. Maybe the it judge wants to back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's, we'll see. See how it goes. Yeah. All right, we've got to go to break. We will be back here in just another minute. Stick around. <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah, well, they're like close. Three weeks ago. Tulsi Gabbard introduces a bill to protect abortion survivors and. Many on the left probably aren't going to be happy about this, but a lot of conservatives and pro-lifers are thrilled. 
she's introduced these two pro-life bills in the House of Representatives, one to protect abortion survivors and then another to protect pain-capable unborn children from abortion. So the first piece of legislation, it would ban late-term abortions after 20 weeks of pregnancy to the point at which an unborn child can feel pain. The second bill would amend Title 18 of the United States Code to ensure a health practitioner exercises the proper degree of care in the case of a child who survives an abortion or attempted abortion. Now, it's interesting to note that Gabbard herself has voted against similar pro-life bills to the ones that she's now introducing. That was in the past. She's been criticized by members of her own party for taking a more moderate position on abortion and supporting some restrictions on abortion in the third trimester. Yogi, what do you think about the bills that she's introduced? It's, it's great news. Uh, I would say um, conservative politicians do not let Tulsi Gabbard outrun you with a humane approach to life, okay? Because she's doing things that conservative politicians are not willing to put their names on, right? I applaud her for it. Somewhere in her campaign when she was running for president, I looked at some of my friends and I said, I want to ask her if she's sure she's running on the right team. Because <laughs> there's some things that comes through with Tulsi at times where you go, she's being sober-minded about things. And yes, she's voted against, some things in the past, but this is huge. Mm -hmm. It's a bold step for her also in her party to do this because she's not going to get support from that party. Yep. So I want conservatives to not just support her in this, but be, be intellectually honest enough to not see her as a Democrat, see her as a human being who's fighting for, for value of life and support her in it. We got to be able to know when we agree and not just be orange man bad on, on the flip side, right? Yes. And then I'm calling on all conservative politicians Ted Cruz, let's lead here, right? To step up and, and tighten their grip on demanding these kinds of, of bills because we need it, you know, absolutely. Yeah. Are you surprised to see this come from her? Uh, well, I mean, I think that people are entitled to changing their mind about uh, complex and complicated issues like this, you know? There are times in my life where uh, I, I, I was for abortion and to to varying different degrees um, but the other thing that I had to come to terms with as a man is that the fact of the matter is that my, my birth mother was a drug addict and I was allowed to be born and uh, I was adopted and you know my life became what it is and if she had taken different uh, different steps I would cease to exist so the the I think as people get older and they get more wisdom and have more perception about what life is, I think that they're entitled to changing their mind. And I think that's something that we need to, uh, we all need to remember because this, this whole idea of you have to be perfect or you're canceled or you, you, know, you have to stick to exactly what you say and always be this it leaves no room for emotional and mental growth or spiritual growth. That's right. And so I think, um, you know, I think it's a big step for her and I support her in that. And I think people, you know, yeah. like, should have an open mind about her. It's a great point. We gotta leave room for growth for sure. Yeah. So the Washington Post, they, they had an op-ed because Pete Buttigieg, you know, he, he said in accepting uh, his cabinet position, he said that travel in his mind is synonymous with growth, with adventure, even love. He said so much so that I proposed to my husband Chaston in an airport terminal, don't let anybody tell you that O'Hare isn't romantic. So then the Washington Post has this op-ed that declared, Pete Buttigieg is right, airports are romantic. So an entire article was written about the statement that airports are romantic in defense of that statement because people were kind of laughing about it, making fun of it. Can you imagine something like that happening for someone in the Trump administration no. if they made a statement like that and then suddenly there's this op-ed defending that oh, the kind it, of silly it, statement? Oh, you'd see smoke <laughs> come out of Rachel Maddow's head and come out of you know, Chris Cuomo and they would go off and crazy. You know, I, but again, I, I look at it and go, okay, so we should travel? Is that what you're saying, Pete? <laughs> exactly. So Pete, you're saying we should travel? 
because Anthony Fauci, your guy, and, and some of the other people just told us stay at home and cancel Christmas. So Pete Buttigieg, people say, have Christmas and travel because it's romantic. <laughs> That's, exactly That's what right. Pete just said. That's what I get from this, right? Go propose in the airport. <laughs> Take your whole family. That's Take right. the pastor, the priest, the pope. Get married, you know, in, in, you know, in Hartsfield Terminal A, you know. So maybe Pete says we should travel. So let's travel. Look, I mean, you can't even. It's ridiculous that a whole op-ed is written on it, yeah. right? But I don't question the fact that an airport could be romantic. I love travel, so let's travel. I, I totally agree. Your thoughts? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm all for it, you know? <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> as, so, as somebody who travels mo nine months out of the year touring <laughs> um, and have had, you know, I just, I'm, I'm in a long distance relationship. And so there's, there's something about, you know, being at the terminal when your partner arrives, mm -hmm. it's like a, it's a magic moment. There, are, it's in all the best love stories in the '80s, all the movies. That's true. You know, so let's travel. You know, I well, and since he has been made the head of the Department of Transportation for a possible Biden administration, it's kind of interesting because we never really paid attention to who had that role before. Yeah, I mean, I don't think anybody could go back. In, in past administrations and name who the person was necessarily. I think good for him for, I think about asking someone to marry me at the airport. What if you're about to go on a flight and they say no? no. Yeah, like, yeah. Or you, you're, or losing, you know, or, you're losing tickets. You're like, oh, what are we gonna Stuck do on now? that trip together. Yeah. A little yeah. awkward. So I think what Pete's saying is be brave. Yeah, be and brave. And travel. Come on. And see your loved ones. Who thought holidays. we'd ever agree with Pete Buttigieg? See, and that's... You see, you, get, you leave room for growth. Room that's for right. Growth. We're looking for the good, and we've found it, which I think is incredible. We just incredible. can't be hypocritical. So that's I right. just say, hey, travel, go propose. Right. Someone on the show just got married, you know, you know, on the crew here. <laughs> James got married just a couple yeah, of years. Yeah, He traveled. Mexico. He had a travel. Mexico was yeah. romantic. I saw a picture mm. of him and his bride-to-be, and they looked pretty romantic. Yeah. On, they, on the airplane, so, yeah. So our advice, listen to Mayor Pete on this one and go travel. we got to go to break. We'll be back with our question of the day coming up. That's such it's a funny so cool. story. It's all about the, the switch. You yeah, know right? yeah. You're like, well, you know. So we asked you on our Twitter poll yesterday, are you hopeful for 2021? 57% of you said no. 43% of you said yes. Quickly, Hopeful for 2021. Yes, yes, always have to be. Yeah, yeah. I am too. Yes. You've got to be. You can't lose hope. God's on the throne. We're good. We're going to fight. Now, our question for today, <laughs> oh, this is a great one. Who would you rather have operating on you, Dr. Jill Biden or Dr. Fauci? I'll do that surgery myself. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go with Yosef Mangel, the angel of death of the Nazi party in 1943. I don't want any of those people touching me right now. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my I, goodness. I mean, Dr. Biden. What a question. Dr. I, yeah, I think we're going to get a, a whole lot of heck no, neither one. Yeah. I don't want them anywhere near me. Oh my goodness. All right, so I want to give people a chance to know more about you, where they can follow you, where they can see what you're working on. So where do they need to go? Thank you. We're excited. We're, we're releasing some promos on our new documentary against fighting trafficking today. So that can go out on, on Instagram, yaku.boyens, Instagram, or sharetogethernow.org. Thank you. Awesome. Tell me what about you? Uh, I'm on all the socials. You can find me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, at Tommy Vex. The band is called Bad Wolves, badwolvesofficial.com for all upcoming tour dates, which have been postponed right. till July 2021. So during this time, do you work on new music or you know, when, you, when you're not able to Over work? this break, I recorded, I recorded three albums this year. Because wow. I had not, because there was nothing else to do, and right. I'm kind of a busybody. Plenty of time to be creative. Yeah, yeah. So did that. Wrote a biography that'll be coming out in 2021. So nice. Yeah. Go check we'll out his music. That? Yes, so good. Thank you so much for being here, both of you guys. All right, we'll be back tomorrow.